All right, so we're back with part two of the Centurion Realism Analysis. In this video, we'll be going over the armor, weapons, emotes, execution, signatures, and ornaments, and anything else of importance. Before I begin, there's a few things I want to say about the first part before we move on to this part. For one, someone brought to my attention that the forward throw might actually be a shove with a shoulder instead of a headbutt. Either way, I still don't like it. <laughs> also, someone brought up a pretty good point with the fact that since Sense left guard is literally just a mirror of his right guards, he most likely wasn't animated to have a shield in his hands as it would make sense to keep swapping his shield and his weapon. That's a fair point, so that being said, I don't think that he was modeled to have a shield in mind, and if he did, it was scrapped very early on in his development. But even if he wasn't meant to have a shield, I think his posture still mimics the style that you would if he had one. So overall, my point still stands with it. Great comment though, I really love the feedback you guys create because it makes for a much deeper and a much more thought-provoking discussion, so thank you guys. One last thing to cover, I had someone give me a comment saying that they wish Centurion, our Centurion in game, was given a scutum when he was made, and I can understand where that sentiment comes from, but I have to disagree. If you think about how the scutum was used, it was primarily a formation tool used in conjunction with multiple other people. Now, granted, there were gladiators that used the scutum in arenas, but that's a different subject for a different time. For the most part, when we're talking about the Roman military and its use of the scutum, we're talking about a full-scale formation to provoke the enemy into an up-close melee. I don't think it would translate well into a game, especially since the game already struggles with its quote-unquote turtle meta. I feel it would be much more boring version of Warlord. Like, let's be honest, Warlord is not in a good place. So I don't know how they would be able to make Scent unique if he had his own shield. He wouldn't be able to keep his current kit as it just wouldn't make sense. Also, we'd miss out on one of the most iconic characters in the game. I don't think we'd have Incredibilis Punch if he had a shield. So just my take on it, let me know what you guys think. With all that being said, we can move on to the armor section. Before we move into the armor section, I just want to make one quick change. There we go, that's better. To preface this section, let's talk about the different types of Roman soldiers that we would see in different eras of the Roman military, and then see which one will correlate in conjunction with our centurion. So to quickly simplify our timeline of Roman history, we can split up the timeline into Roman Republic history and then Imperial Roman history. When we talk about the centurion in game, we'll mostly be talking about Imperial Rome. But to start the talk about Imperial Rome, we'll have to talk about the Roman Republic first. Don't worry, I'll try to make this quick. So, the Roman Republic is basically Rome before the Marian reforms. Remember those? It, out of the other things that it did, helped standardize the military so everyone can be equipped with enough gear to make even the poorest of soldiers equipped well enough to make themselves useful in a formation. In the Roman Republic, though, there were some soldiers who were relatively poor known as the Valetes. The Valetes wore very little armor, which consisted of a leather cap helmet and a round shield. Their weapon was a spear, but even their spears had soft iron spearheads compared to hardened steel. Then after that, they had two soldier classes called the Hestati and the Principes, the latter being wealthier than the former. They would be both outfitted with an oval-shaped scutum and equipped with a gladius. The Principes were equipped with a spear earlier on, but then phased out for the gladius in later years. These were very similar to the legionaries that we know of in Imperial Rome, but unlike the legionaries of Imperial Rome, they were only able to have this gear if they were able to afford it. The next soldier class was known as the Triari. These soldiers were basically the veteran class. They were equipped with an oval scutum, a spear, and either a coat of mail or some sort of leather armor. They would be used as the last line of defense in a skirmish. So now with all that information, we can talk about what happened after the Marian reforms. Once the Marian reforms were in place, having to acquire your own arms and armor was not required. Along with that, you didn't need to own property to be selected for military service, as the census now counted people by heads instead of by properties. Along with the standardization of equipment, the training and drilling was also standardized across the Legion. To quickly sum up the reason why I talked about the events leading up to Imperial Rome is that now we have the Roman infantry that we mostly know. So this is when the use of other armor types gets popularized like the Lorica Segmentata, segmented plate armor, and Lorica Squamata, scale armor. Though some of the wealthier classes before the reforms and early forms of the Imperial Legion still use Lorica Hamata, chain mail armor, they switch between Segmentata and sometimes Squamata, but then went back to Hamata because it's easier to maintain and based off of their defensive tactics like the Testudo, it doesn't warrant the use of really restrictive but protective armor. 
Now I try to make that section somewhat brief to quickly lay out some context while also making it inclusive of as much important information as possible. I'm fairly certain that it's all factually correct, but sometimes with the use of brevity we tend to leave out some important details. But hopefully I didn't, and now that we've laid a bit of context we can move on to the in-game content. Starting with the armors we have the helmet. The helmet for Roman legionaries was also known as the Galea. When it comes to the helmet of ancient Rome, there have been many different styles that they have come up with. Today we're going to be focusing on the Gallic helmet. The Gallic helmet is what most people would probably think of when it comes to Roman helmets. The helmet that would be used by Roman legionaries were perfected over the years as a tool and a piece of protection that works especially well for their tactics. And here, I will explain how. But first, let's talk about the in-game helmets. Overall, they are roughly all the same. There are four types of helmets, but that doesn't really matter because we want to focus on one type here. And from that one type, we want to look at a specific helmet, the Campania helmet. This helmet in particular shares a lot in resemblance with the Gallic helmet. It's got the cheek plates on each side like the Gallic helmet does. It has the eyebrow details that look like they would be a cosmetic choice, but actually adds a bit of protection to the top of the helmet. It even has a back plate for further back and neck protection. The greatest resemblance of all though would be the ear cutouts. This provides easy access to hearing, which is important for how vital commands from a centurion are. This means that the tactics and formations that they use can be easily ordered and completed. Compare that to a fully enclosed helm and you damper your hearing ability by much more than an exposed ear. Also remember that in a closed formation, they would be able to protect themselves so much to where having their ear exposed would basically be a non-issue. The problems this helm has in reality are quite minor compared to how much it gets right. For starters, some of the protection is lacking compared to an original. There should be a small but thick bill that protrudes slightly from the brow section of the helmet. This would help prevent frontal attacks to the head should the enemy get close enough to attack. Another thing is where the ear does expose, there's no protecting cuff around the opening like there would be on an original. Again, all minor things considering how much they have correct. But there is one thing that for the most part is incorrect. That is the idea of a face mask attached to the helmet. Masks attached to helmets were a thing during Roman times, but they were usually designated to cavalry use. Either that or it could be tied to parade use as well. That being said, do the masks that they use correlate to plausible masks that could have been used in ancient Rome? If I had to choose, I'd say yes. So honestly, overall they got a majority of the stuff right. And if we take into consideration the standards of some reproduction armor or weapon manufacturers these days, then I suppose this video game reproduction isn't that bad at all. Up next, the chest pieces and the rest of the body. Remember how I said that there would be three types of armor? The Lorica Segmentata, Lorica Squamata, and Lorica Hamata? Well, the game actually uses two of those. Funnily enough, the one it excludes is probably the most used armor throughout the entire Roman military, the Lorica Hamata. The other armor type piece I haven't mentioned yet that's in game is also a historical piece of armor, but not really known for its battlefield uses in the Roman military compared to the others. That last kind of armor piece can be known as the Rica Musculata, or roughly muscle cuirass in Latin. This armor is quite a curious choice as it doesn't really have any ties to the Roman civilization except for the occasional ceremonial use for emperors and maybe even tribunes. But what the muscle cuirass might be more popular for is the quote unquote Spartan hoplite soldier class of ancient Greece. I already talked about how some things in game for Centurion is a bit of a mix of few things from Roman legionary, a gladiator, and a stereotypical Spartan, all of which mostly to boost the sales of the character as I'm fairly certain literally one of the first DLC heroes available. So it makes sense that they would try to perpetuate this idealized Hollywood-esque version of an ancient soldier. Would a Lorica Musculata be useful in combat? Technically yes, if used with the type of soldier formations that focus on shield more than armor. If we look back even further than the Romans, we can see the Greeks use it in phalanx formations with its hoplites. But the way that the in-game centurion fights, it requires agility and probably the ability to bend down without pushing their chest armor into their throat. So between all the armor types we have available, there are some that are more helpful than others for how centurion fights. In short, the scale armor would give him the most mobility, the segmentata will give him less mobility, and the muscle cuirass will give him the least. If he had access to male armor, then that would outright give him the most mobility out of all the options. Considering how much the Roman military focuses on teamwork and shield formations, it made sense that they decided to go back to the lightweight and easy to produce and repair armor like male. That being said, that doesn't make them the most to least realistic. 
Let's look at some of our options to talk about which is the most realistic out of each armor type. When we are looking at the armors for the Centurion and ask ourselves which of these are the most realistic, we then bring up the question of what do these armors look like. That gets a bit difficult when we think about how the ancient Roman civilization is nearly 2000 years old and at least 1500 years old. This means that when it comes to the accurate representations of some piece of armor, it's a bit more difficult than trying to recreate pieces from the medieval era, considering we have much more sources from artwork to even some well-kept surviving examples. That being said, that doesn't mean we don't have any artwork or surviving examples of armor from Rome either, this just means that all of our sources are a bit rarer, which makes it harder to come to concrete conclusions. For Lorica Segmentata, we have some artwork examples like from Trajan's Column. We also have some pieces of a surviving example like in this picture, which gives us a general idea of what the armor would look like. Now if I had to choose which of the chess pieces is mostly historical when it comes to the Segmentata, I would say the Baetica chess, most likely. All of the Segmentata follows this base model and then adds upon it, but keeping it simple is usually the key to finding the reality in this situation especially when it comes to a common soldier's set of armor. Overall shape isn't too bad. The armor tapers to his waist, which is what you'd want in Lorica Segmentata. You see in a lot in reproductions that they look like you're wearing a giant tin can because they wanted to make it a one size fit all when that really wasn't the case back then. The leather strap connections aren't really historical as buckles didn't really have much of a prominence as leather laces would be just as effective and also be much cheaper to replace. Maybe straps were used on some, but it'd be quite hard to find evidence to verify that. I do like that the connection on the segmentata is right down the center. Most people don't realize that the armor is not like a vest, but rather it's two halves that are tied together. Sadly, because there is a cape in the way, I can't really check if another attachment fixture is on the back to see if they made it as if there were two halves. But considering that no one else will ever really see it, then I'd say they did pretty good. You'll see that there's some sort of male vest underneath the segmentata. Ah, uh -huh, maybe that's what Lyrica Amata went. Anyways, that isn't really realistic for this period as multiple layers of armor would be a waste of resources that, at least for Imperial Rome, the government would have to supply. Also, as I have stated before, the reliance upon armor wasn't as great as it would be in the late medieval era where skirmishes were much smaller and the weapons were much better. Instead, they used shield formations which protect them from yada 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 you get the point. Really I'm not going to knock them for adding mail underneath plate for two reasons. One, they are trying to spice up a relatively plain set of armor and I get that. This is a game and it needs to look flashy. Two, this character is part of the knights faction and that means that they're with characters that have armor and the materials to make mail with plate. Maybe there's some sort of lore reason behind it, I don't know. Moving on to the last bit, we can see that this dangly little straps from his belt, this would be known as, and forgive my pronunciation, I don't speak Latin, Singulum Militare. Basically a military belt to show that he's a high ranking soldier. His looks a little worse for wear, but there are a lot of armor sets in this game that have that look and at this state I'm just led to believe that they're in constant state of combat and just don't have time to maintain their equipment. Moving on to the next piece of armor we have the Lorica Squamata, but in this game it's known as the Savia Chest. Okay, so the problem with this one is that they're extremely hard to find examples of this armor either in artwork or in surviving examples. So much so that I can't even really find the general shape of what it's meant to be in. What does this mean? Well really, all I know, this is based off of modern reproductions. Now if we were to base this armor off of that and make the hopeful assumption that the reproductions were based off of some findings that I can't find but have some validity to it, then I'd say this armor piece is pretty good. It's covered in a bunch of scale plates obviously, but out of the small sample of a finding that I did see, the scales are very similar in shape to each other. It also has a strap harness system that goes with it including the disc plates on each corner of the harness, and to be honest, I don't know what these are. Maybe some sort of attachment system? If you know, feel free to share your source with me in the comments. Also in this version of the chess piece, the Centurion has a medieval plaque belt with it which we see a lot in 14th to 15th century effigies. So really not something that would be considered Roman, but I guess it's okay because, you know, it's the Knights faction. There's some studded straps around the skirting of the armor. I don't think there's any practical historical use to those, it might be a rendition of the Singulum. Last but not least, we have the Lorica Musculata, or for the one I chose in game, it would be the Umbrian chest. 
Now, this was kind of a contentious choice for me. When it comes to the Roman use of the musculata, it was more or less meant to be showy. That means it could have been pretty interesting designs on it. That being said, I chose the one with the most subtle because one, it's a centurion, not an emperor, so it makes sense the armor would be less ornate. Two, if it is going to be used in combat, a lot of those fine details would go to waste if it gets all scratched up. Now even though it may be the most subtle, it still has some nice details to it. It has two laurels on each side, which is a symbol of the Roman Empire. It also has a two-piece attachment system, and then shoulder straps to keep it in place. Now it also has some more dangly straps, which I can assume is just more the cingulum, but they're really wide. I don't know what to think of them. Now those are all the chess pieces. I hope that Ubisoft adds Lorica Hamata later in the game, but sadly, all we can do is hope. I want to move on to arms, but you might be thinking that I'm forgetting the lower half of his body because it's technically part of the chess pieces, but I will come back to that. I just need to quickly talk about the arms since they're so integral to the actual chess piece. Now as for the arms, this is going to go pretty quick because all of them have about the same protection. So really, what I can say for one can apply to all. So I want to move right into the historical realism behind it. To knock out a lot of options, I can just start by saying that pauldrons were not a piece of armor worn during this time period, or at least by Roman legionaries. Now the shoulders were a vital position that could be exposed easily, but they didn't put big shoulder pads, rather they just needed to double up the protection in that area. A good example is what looks like a collarbone protector on the Lorica Hamata. That's actually to double up the male in case you get hit there. So with that being said, is there any arm piece that could be historical? I'd say the best bet would be the Baetica arms. These are just legitimately the normal extension to Lorica Segmentata chest piece. Now you might think, but wouldn't these count as pauldrons then? Eh, not really. Those shoulder pieces are meant to be part of the Segmentata. You couldn't just strap them on without a chest piece, regardless of what the game is telling us. So, how does that compare to a real one? Well, there's some riveting around the edges for some reason, don't know what that's for, there are also leather straps on top of the shoulder pieces that make us assume that they are originally two pieces of metal put together by one strap. Although I think a single leather strap would make it too loose, I don't think it's implausible. As for the bracers and male gauntlets, yeah, that's just a no. Bracers really had no use for the form of warfare the Roman military implied, and male arm protection and military use would not arrive until much later in European history. That being said, I think it's really cute that they have a small Roman legion symbol on one of the bracers. Now before I finish this section, one thing I want to address is the furs that you might see sticking out of armor. Would Roman soldiers use furs like that? I really don't see why they wouldn't. Obviously you wouldn't just do this on a whim, but there have been accounts by Roman writers that soldiers would use furs as socks during the winter as it would keep them warm and provide a bit of insulation as well. I could see a Roman soldier using fur to insulate other armor pieces as well if he had to. Now. Coming back to do the lower half of the body, let me start by saying that every single one wears pants. Why? Roman soldiers did not wear pants, or at least not how they portrayed it in For Honor. I thought maybe, at first, it was a problem with how they rated the game and that the audience couldn't handle the centurion's bulging thighs, but then we look and we see that both male and female gladiator doesn't wear pants. I'm just very confused by it, but I guess it's okay. Moving on, we can see that the Centurion wears shin guards, which is something that Centurions would be issued and allowed to wear. Maybe not the kinds that are in For Honor, but I'm saying that it's not unreasonable. Finally, I want to talk about the shoes. More specifically, the Roman military shoe, which was actually a sandal called a caligae. I think, again, that the best example in-game of what would be historical would be the Baetica chess piece. Now, they have what looks kind of like a caligae, but I don't see any brass clasps or fixtures on it at all. That's not really a problem as it could just be all leather with a wood sole or something along those lines. But since there isn't a lot of details that I can really look at, I'm just going to say that these shoes are okay. Overall I don't think that the lower half would be that bad at all if they just removed the pants. Just one question though. What? Is there a way to take off my pants? That covers the armor, now let's move on to weapons. More specifically, the Gladius. Now, I want to say, I think they did a really good job with the Gladius. They gave plenty of options when it comes to practical and realistic designs that I really had to narrow it down to some of what I think is the best. So I'm going to try and go through these as fast as I can while still hitting some important points I want to talk about. Let's start with the blades. When it comes to Roman Gladi, there are a few different sword blades that we could talk about. When it's For Honor's Gladius, 
we're really going to be looking at one pattern and that's the mains gladius pattern this is the pattern that sort of has a leaf shape to it there are some other blades that are kind of close to the other patterns but for the sake of brevity and because of how spot on they did with the mains pattern we're just going to continue from here i think the best blade out of all of them would be the victorious hercules blade Although there's a concerning amount of rust on the blade, a pet peeve of mine, they really got the shape down to a T, between the point to the cross section and even the material. It looks like it's made out of a high carbon steel, which I mean, I'd say debatably these kinds of swords wouldn't be made out of a really high carbon steel and polish this kind of sheen, but they are at least for sure not made of iron. That's a different discussion for a different time though. As for this blade in particular, the Victorious Hercules set was part of the Assassin's Creed event, which means if you didn't get it, you're kinda shit out of luck. There's another very close runner up called the Tempered Blade. It roughly has the same blade shape as the Victorious Hercules blade, it just looks a little bit less polished. Maybe that's what you want though, because honestly between the two, it's mostly just personal preference on who gets first place. Up next, the guards. Now realistically, these aren't like your typical cross guard. They aren't guarding your hand from enemy blows, they're guarding your hand from your own sword. The gladius is a very thrust based weapon and people don't realize that if you thrust with a lot of momentum and you hit an object that's not going to be penetrated or won't move, then your sword is going to stop moving while your hand continues to keep wanting to move. Does that make sense? I feel like I said move a lot. Regardless, the best case scenario, you get a ridiculous amount of hand shock. The worst case scenario, your hand slips up past the handle, onto the blade, and you lose a few fingers. Now with that in mind, we have quite a few guards I want to speak briefly about, so in no way is this a list by superiority, it's just me trying to go down the list and talk about some notable guards. Starting off, we have the Battle Worn Guard. This guard is a simple wood guard with a metal band around it. It's what you could expect from basic mass-produced gladi for soldiers. Next up, we have the Victorious Hercules Guard, another wood guard with the Eagle of the Roman Empire on it. I think it's really nice and possibly something that a high-ranking soldier or a well-off soldier could use. Up next, the Pax Guard. Definitely something really ornate, maybe even something a higher-up military leader would have. Next, the Scorpion Guard. This one is really interesting because I can't tell if it's some sort of onyx or if it's some sort of dark lacquered wood. Either way, this guard looks beautiful and it kind of reminds me of a reproduction sword from Deltin. Up next, the trusty guard. Another wood guard, but this one has a metal band or cap on the top. Lastly, we have the Munifex guard. This is the default guard, and like some of the others, it's made out of wood, and this one has a copper, brass, or bronze cap to it as well. Definitely not bad, all things considering, it's a default. Now let's move on to the handle slash pommels. If you saw a lot of the guards I chose were made out of wood, that's because realistically when making a gladius, it's a cheap material, it's lightweight, and it's relatively easy to repair or replace. That being said, when moving onto the handles, you might see that they're not all wood, although there's probably still going to be a lot of them still being wood. Starting off, a wood handle and pommel. Like I said, wood is a really great material just because of how versatile it is, so it makes sense to use it for a lot of sword handles. When it comes to the Victorious Hercules hilt, it really shows a nice possibility for an all wood hilt gladius. Notice the carved out gaps on the handles for the fingers to make it more ergonomic. It's very nice. Next we have the Pax hilt, a very ornate hilt just like its guard that could very well be used by a high ranking official. Things like this would boost morale in men because they like to see their leaders in almost a hero like figure as it would give them more confidence in their leadership. Up next, the scorpion hilt. This one is really exceptional because it looks like we have our first look at a bone handle. This was a nice alternative to using wood as it would give a handle a nice white or eggshell color finish while also not being that hard to replace. As for its pommel, it looks like a little bit small for a gladius, but if it were made out of onyx, it would definitely be a lot heavier than wood, so I think it would make sense that it'd be that small. Up next we have the trusty hilt. I like this one because we have a nice grip and a relatively right sized pommel, but then we can see that the pommel is not a sphere shape, it's like a cone. I'm glad that they represent all different types of hilt shapes because not all gladius pommels were a sphere shape, and this is a really good example. Lastly we have the munifix hilt. Again, pretty good for a default handle. As we can see, there aren't any contours in the handle for fingers, but that's a good representation that it's not always the case. Even though the Roman Empire was a largely organized military, doesn't mean that their issued gear was all standardized like today's military. Overall, it's a solid handle. 
The Gladius is a really interesting weapon with a very unique background, and I think Ubisoft really did this weapon a service with how many options they gave it when it came to customizing this sword. I really wish they gave the same love when making Warden's Longsword, but regardless they deserve praise for their work here. And really, all I've shown is the realistic handles, and there's much more pseudo-realistic and fantasy handles for this character that you can make it however you want. And you can see that I'm a very big fan of the Vicious Hercules, so I decided to make a full set for me here. Moving on to quickly touch on the executions. I know there was someone who wanted me to share my thoughts on the executions, and honestly I really don't have much else to say realistically or historically. I could say that Ale Iacta Est is a Latin pun for the original saying, which is Ale Iacta Est, which means the die has been cast, but instead of saying Ale Iacta Est, which means the arm has been cast. Get it? Because the centurion lobs off the enemy's arm? Yeah. Besides that, I don't think I really have much else to say that isn't already known by the community. Although, if you have any questions in particular, I do try to make an effort to reply to all comments, so if you can post your question there, I'll try to get back to you on it. As for emotes, I have a few things to say about those. Starting off, I have an obligatory PSA of don't put your sword in the ground or else you'll dull it. Alright, now we can continue. Starting off, the combat emote Imperial Salute is quite interesting because that is actually how they would salute in formation, with their sword angled away from their body. Small nods to actual history like this is why I always find this game so interesting. Next, the You're Going Down emo has the Centurion doing a thumbs down. We see the Centurion doing this for Police Verso as well. Now, a majority of the community knows by now that thumb signals are a reference to gladiatorial combat and whether or not the enemy combatant should be spared or not. I find this kind of funny because they gave all this stuff to the Centurion and not the Gladiator, but whatever. What people may not realize is that we only know that they use thumb gestures to signal to the crowd whether or not the combatant dies. We don't know what gestures meant exactly what. According to some historians, the thumbs up actually means that the enemy combatant dies and a thumb tucked into a clenched fist meant that he lives. We only assume thumbs up or down due to modern implications of it. Also a little fun fact for the execution polis verso, the actual phrase polis verso means with a turned thumb, unlike the popular misconception it means thumbs down. Let's talk about feats I guess so I can really say that I covered everything. Starting off with the first character specific feat, Centurion's March. I mean used to be character specific I guess. Regardless, this feat gives you infinite stamina for a short time. I find the name of this feat quite interesting because being a part of the Roman Legion meant that you were expected to be able to march for 22 miles with 45 pounds of equipment within roughly 6 hours. This is something that they are taught to do before they even learned how to do combat. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that this feat makes sense for a Roman centurion considering how critical stamina was to being a soldier. Just saying. Up next for a tier 2 feat we have Pugio, also pronounced as Pugio or Puyo. A Pugio was basically a dagger for all soldiers, but higher ranking officials would have more ornate ones. The use for one of these would most likely be used for stabbing just like the Gladius, so stabbing but also being able to cut if need be. That being said, I don't know if throwing them would be that effective, although with how hard the Centurion punches and throws, I am sure that it really doesn't matter in the first place. Also, one final thing, the plural of Pugio is Pugiones. That's debatably worse than Gladi. Lastly, but definitely not least, we have Phalanx, which if you don't know is a shield formation somewhat comparable to the Testudo. It was used in ancient civilizations that predate the Romans, most notably the Greeks, but also much further than that as well, like Sumerians and Egyptians. The common theme amongst the phalanx that separates it from a Roman testudo would be how the formations are held and also, more importantly, the use of a spear and shield unlike the Roman preference of a gladius and scutum, which in of itself was a much more different shield that was made specifically for testudo formations. Why they decided to name his feet phalanx instead of testudo, I don't know. Maybe because they decided to give it to other characters as well, like Zhang Jun, someone who doesn't have a shield and uses a Guan Dao, which is more like a glaive than a spear. Finally, let's talk about ornaments. More specifically, let's talk about helmet plumes. Let's start with the one that you get with the Season Pass. It's the plume that goes straight forward across the top of the head like a mohawk. What's really interesting about this one is it's called Sentry, which is also what a Centurion commands. A Centurion commands a century of men. 
Whether that's 100 men or specifically 80 men, there's a mishap in verbiage, it's up for debate. I've even heard that it's specifically 80 men and 20 slaves. Regardless, that is where Centurion gets his name. The thing about this ornament though, even though it does look very nice, is that it's going the wrong direction. It's supposed to go across the head horizontally, not vertically. The one that the Centurion has here is correct if he was a basic legionary and he was wearing it for a parade. Otherwise, the one a Centurion would wear even into battle would go horizontally across the head. That being said, if you want one that kind of fits that bill, you have the feathered crest ornament. Now when talking about the plumes in real life, they were usually made out of horsehair and would look relatively like what we see on the Century ornament but they were made out of feathers as well. It was just more common to see them as horsehair. The only problems I have with the feathered crest ornament is that it looks kinda meager with its use of feathers. It should be a bit more than that. Also, it doesn't change colors like the century does. That means that you can't have a nice red color and you're going to be stuck with white. Honestly, I hope that Yubi gives us the option to change that in the future so that you can make the feathers whatever color you want. An honorable mention would also be the Cobra Plume, which faces the right way for a Centurion and is made out of red horsehair, but the only problem is that it also has a very ostentatious ornament with what looks like a skull and a snake moving through it. That and it's also a legendary tier reward from ranked matches for Season 5, so I don't know how many people would actually be able to use this for their Centurion. So that's everything I could think of. If you have anything else you'd like to add, you can leave that with any other questions, comments, or concerns down below. I make an active effort to check all of them and try to respond if necessary. As for the next analysis, I'm probably going to be doing a Lawbringer video because there are quite a few people who really wanted Lawbringer, so I will kindly oblige that request. That being said, if you see a gap between the first Centurion video and the next, you'd notice that these take a ridiculous amount of time to make due to all the writing for the script, the research, and the recording and editing. I have to do all that along with working my job and still make time for stuff that I want to do. So it is coming, I just don't know when. Now the other thing that I probably should have prefaced this previous section by saying is that I just recently got a bunch of recordings of me doing some test cutting with some real swords that I would like to review. That means I might be uploading some sword slash HEMA stuff soon that isn't inherently For Honor related. It takes much less work to upload those videos as it requires a lot less editing and writing so please don't think it detracts from my time spent on the next analysis as I haven't started doing research for that. But now that this video is out and some other sword videos are in the works already, I can start doing some polearm combat research in the meantime. With all that said and done, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then liking it would be very appreciated as it hopefully means that more people who might be interested in it would see it. If you like this content and would like to see more of it in an erratic and spontaneous frequency, then go ahead and subscribe. At some point, I will complete a video for every night on the roster and maybe more. Well anyways, sword video or videos maybe next, depending on how quickly I can make them, and then Lawbringer video and then I don't know. Let me know if I should do after that Peacekeeper, that sounds kind of fun, maybe BP or Conk if anyone's interested. I'm up for whatever. Regardless, thank you for watching, I appreciate it a lot, and I hope I'll see you guys next time.